morning. How's the family this morning? Well, it's been an interesting week, hasn't it? The election's over. We no longer have to go through that or worry about that. Actually, it's time to move on to more important things. We need to deal with the issue of vending machines. More important things. The ones that hold the Dr. Peppers. <laughs> I know you're saying, where's he going with this? <laughs> well, some things are more important to some people than they are to others, all right? <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning. We're just thankful. Father God, we're thankful that you hear our prayers. We're thankful, Father God, that... Uh, you just show blessing and favor on us here at the, your church house. And Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for the veterans that stepped up and did their part, Father God, that we'd be able to go to the polls and vote and that we'd be able to stand here and worship to you today. Father, we pray that you be with us. I pray that you just move me over. Put your hand over my mouth, Father God, and what comes out of my mouth be from you, not from me. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Well, I have two $1 bills here this morning. I have one that is a actually a nice, crisp dollar bill that Lulu actually gave me this morning. There are probably some that are a lot newer that you get from the bank. And they, you know, they don't bend. They're not all beat up or anything like that. And then I have an old one that's all crumpled up, and actually it's torn. I've had them where they've been taped, but this one's got tears in it, and uh, it's old. It's kind of thin. I guess they wear thin after a while, and it's kind of dirty. And as I do most Sundays when I arrive here, as I walk into my office, I put everything on my desk and kind of get things organized, then I walk out and I visit with the people that are here at that time, Sometimes come up and visit with the band. And once all that's done, then I walk back there to the kitchen and I hand Lulu a dollar and I buy me a Dr. Pepper. And I go in there and I set it on my desk and I review my sermon notes and stuff and I enjoy my drink right there at that time. And that's pretty simple. In fact, that's really simple because Lulu takes my dollar and pushes me out of the way and, you know, it's all done. But have you ever tried to pay for a drink or anything else that might be in a vending machine with a $1 bill? Many of us have. You know, sometimes when you do that, it can be very frustrating. It can be very aggravating. You know what I'm talking about. Don't sit there like, oh, what's he talking about? You know what I'm talking about. You go to get something out of the vending machine, and it can be frustrating. Several years ago, vending machines, many years ago, only took coins. They didn't take paper bills. They only took coins. So it was pretty simple. You wound up losing your coins sometimes. You know, you put them in. You didn't get anything back out of it. But they improved it. Now vending machines not only take dollar bills, they also take credit cards. I can't see myself sliding a credit card. I don't know. That just depends on how desperate I am for a Dr. Pepper that time. But now vending machines are very smart. You know, they've, they've improved them. You, like I say, you, you stick a dollar in, and, you, you know, it's a whole lot simpler than carrying all that change around in your pocket just to be able to buy something out of a vending machine. And vending machines have everything in them now. I mean, you go to the post office, that's how you get stamps. You, you know, you go, you, some, sometimes you go to the car wash. You're gonna, that's how you pay for to wash your car, but you also, if you're going to buy anything with it, you're going to slide, you know, coins in there to get extra stuff from towels to spray to go on your tires or sin or whatever you're going to get. And as many of you know, vending machines have candy, they have gum, they have cookies, they have everything. Everything in vending machines. So they had to improve them, so everybody quit having to carry that big pocket of change around, and now they improved them, so you could use, a, of course, a credit card, but mainly dollar bills. I thought that was a great deal because everything has in, increased in price. 
So, you know, sometimes you wind up, I don't know if you've been to some of these places, but a drink can cost you two bucks out of a vending machine. Well, if you carry enough change around, you're going to be leaning to one side, you know, with all that change. So I'm glad that they did improve them, and they did make it where vending machines would take a dollar. But there's one problem with that that gets us all really, really frustrated. You know, you put your dollar bill in there just a little ways in that slot, and it'll just suck it right up in there, you know, and so you're ready to push the button and get your drink. But about the time you get ready to push that button and get the drink, it spits it back out at you. And you go, up. Oh, Oh, maybe I did something wrong. So you take the bill, you look at it, you look at the machine, and you make sure George's head is turned the right way, you know, because you turn it upside down, it'll kick it back out. So you look, you make sure you match up George's head with a little sign, and you slide it back in there. You're ready to get your drink or whatever, and it spits it back out again. And you're saying, okay, wait a minute, something's wrong here. So you look at that dollar bill, and, of course, it's an old crumpled dollar bill. So you're going to figure out a way to make it work because it's probably the only one you got at the time. So you straighten out the edges. You know how the little corners get bent down. So you straighten out all the edges. You make sure if it's torn, you put it back. Or you go grab some tape or something. You may have some that's already taped. But you're going to get it where it's better. So you take that bill. You've already straightened out the corners. You're ready to go. You look up there and make sure George's head is the right way. And you slide it right back up in there. And it sucks it up in there so you know you did it. You're ready to go. About the time you get ready to push that button, it spits it back out again. Now you're getting frustrated. You're thinking, wait a minute. Then you do the old thing. Everybody's done this. You take that dollar bill and you put it up on the edge and you rub it. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you lost. I, man, I got this down. You take that dollar bill and you just rub it and pull it and get it flat and straight and crisp and it's ready to go. Even an old dollar bill, you can straighten it out like that. So you know you got it. You got the edges straightened out. You don't have a bunch of tears. You know you got it smoothed out where it's perfect. And you slide it up in there and it takes it right in there. So you know you're good to go till you get up ready to push that button again. And here it comes. You know why they put bars around some of these machines? It spits it back out and you are just aggravated to know. So you know right now it's not going to take your dollar. So you got two choices. You can either walk away from the machine, thirsty, or you can go find you a crisp dollar bill somewhere and put it in there. So normally, that's what you do, or you start digging in your pocket trying to find a better dollar bill, and sure enough, you get a brand new one that's crisp and clean, and you make sure George's little head's the right way, and it'll go right in there, and it takes it, and all you got to do is push the button. Normally, it'll drop you what you want. Sometimes my luck is not looking and making sure the machine's got what I want in it. Any of you done that? Got something you didn't want, and then you go, you want this? <laughs> so you went through all that frustration for nothing. But any of you that's ever put a bill in a machine and it's rejected, you know what I'm talking about. It kind of gets you a little frustrated because it's hard to understand what the deal is here. To me, to many of y'all, it may not make any sense. Because to me, it doesn't make any sense. A dollar bill is a dollar bill. They're all the, you know what I'm saying? A dollar bill's worth is the same no matter whether it's, you know, it's taped, it's crumpled up, it's torn, it's, it's worn out, any of that, but it's still worth a dollar. So why does it reject it that way? And it takes the new crisp one. You know, it, it makes you wonder, what, what's the deal here? It's worth a dollar bill no matter what. So did they mess up on their, you know, their planning of their machines or what took place there? Well, actually, the deal is I guess they want to make sure they're really getting a dollar bill, a, a real dollar bill because people know how to beat them. But why would this machine accept a good-looking bill and reject an old worn-out one? You know, a clean, fresh one's of no greater value than a worn-out, crumpled one. No difference at all. But, you know, I really don't like to admit this, but I think sometimes myself and people can be just like those vending machines, just exactly. Some people seem to be more accepting to people who have it all together than they do to accepting people who have been folded, taped, worn out, bruised, washed, 
not very neat and clean. You know, the people that's been through the ringer, you know, they've had it pretty rough. They find themselves rejected as much by Christians as they do not non-Christians. Some people prefer to accept only the cream of the crop, the pristine, the clean and the crisp is who they tend to accept. And this is not only with a non-Christian but a lot of times with Christians. You know, when James was writing to the Christians, he was disturbed at the fact that followers of Christ could show such preferential treatment, partiality, basically. He was amazed that Christians would do that. He refers to a situation where two people come into a church one wearing really fine, nice clothes, and the other not wearing not such fine clothes, but a little dirty and a little ragged. The one wearing the fine clothes, he's escorted right up to the front. Let's sit right up here in the front with all the elders and with all the important people that are up front. But the one dressed not so nice, they either ask him to leave or put him at the very back. In the cheap seats. You know, because... They don't think he's good enough to be part of that. And that's what James is trying to point out here. So if you turn with me, we're going to James chapter 2, begin at verse 1. James chapter 2, begin at verse 1. My brothers and sisters, Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who loved him. But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting (coughs) exploiting you. Exploiting you. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep my royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. No clearer than that. Favoritism is a sin. If you show partiality to somebody based on who they are, what they are, what they have, what they look like, then you're showing favoritism or you're being partial And it's called a sin. Man, a lot of people say, Raleigh, I I didn't know that. Well, sure it is. It's real clear right there in the Bible. James is basically saying here, my brothers and sisters, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, never think some people are more important than others. But it's easy to get there. It's easy to believe in our minds that we're better than somebody else. But that's not what Jesus did. He never looked at people like that. Never at all. So here in our human flesh, we're sinful in that way. That we tend to start to judge someone just by their appearance. What does they say? You never know if it's a good book until you open the cover and look inside. So we should never do that. And the Bible's real clear about that. There's an old story by John Denver about a man invited to a fancy banquet. He arrived wearing simple clothing and was told to get out and go in the kitchen door for a handout. He looked that bad. He left. He went home, got dressed up, and went back to the banquet. This time he was admitted and seated in a special place. The guest was startled. When the food came and the man began to pour the food and drink on his coat, saying, eat this coat, 
drink this Coke? When he was asked what he was doing, he said, it was my suit that was invited to the banquet, not me. When I came earlier wearing simple homespun clothing, I was kicked out. But when I returned in my suit, I was invited in. So I can only conclude that it was my suit and not me who was invited to the banquet. Amen? That's kind of how cowboy church is looked at a little bit. You know, we don't have those suits and ties on, so sometimes we're looked at a little harder. You know, we wear our cowboy hats in church. You know, we're looked at a little harder. But Jesus Christ is alive and well right here in J-Bar C. Cowboy Church is any church in town, right? That's what it's all about. It's got nothing to do with that at all. We're all here pulling on the same rope, as I always say. We're all here to do a job for God. First of all, to praise Him and then disciple for Him. And that's exactly what we do. But we tend to make judgment calls on some factor other than the real person. We just tend to do it. It's in, in a lot of people's natural DNA. So we wind up committing a sin by showing partiality or favoritism. It happens every day. It happens in the workforce. It happens in our government. It happens in just day-to-day -day life with family and friends. But Jesus looked at all people the same way. He showed no partiality. It didn't make a difference to him what an individual looked like, how he dressed, where he lived, what type of work he did, and what worldly possessions he owned. That made no difference to Jesus Christ. He looked at everybody equal. Jesus, Jesus showed no favoritism in the, in the way that he did not treat one person any better than the other. Man, do we have a long way to go. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. Many of you know this scripture. Many of you have read this scripture. You've probably heard it preached on several times. But this is a good example of favoritism. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. It says, On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away leaving him half dead a priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man he passed by on the other side so too a Levite when he came to the place and saw him passed by on the other side but a Samaritan as he traveled came where the man was and when he saw him he took pity on him he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. A priest and a Levite. Now some of you are saying, well, what's a Levite? Well, a Levite was like, he was like the assistant to the priest. You know, he had special favors also in the temple. So both of these men, religious men, religious leaders, walked completely on the other side of the road away from a guy that had been beaten almost dead, but he, he was not clean cut. He wasn't part of the elite or anything like that. So they stayed as far away from him as they could. And Jesus said, who is the most justified in this and of course this Samaritan that's how we get a good Samaritan right there you know that's pretty sad but that's true that's exactly what goes on in society because we judge that factor in people from time to time 
we're no different sometimes. Even though the priest and the Levite, they saw the man there, they chose to leave him to die. Religious leaders chose to leave a man to die. He wasn't worth anything to them. He was a nobody. He, they thought he was worth nothing. And that's why they left him there. Where would we be today if Jesus Christ thought we were nothing? We would be in the same mess where people just walked around us, didn't care about us. And that's why we're instructed to be like Jesus, to show the same that he would. Jesus died for all mankind, not just for a chosen few or a certain group of people. He died for everyone, everyone. So he wanted everybody to be equal. And we know the Bible tells us that when we all get to heaven, that's where we're going to be. Every knee will bow. Everyone will answer to God for their actions at that time. Would you want to stand before Jesus and answer for something like that? I would say no, I would not want to. Just like that old folded taped, crumpled dollar bill had the same value as a new crisp one, so did humans to Jesus. So did man to man. They had the same value. I have the same value as the next guy in the eyes of Jesus Christ. You know, I know when we get to heaven, if you run into some of the the big name celebrities that are already there, Elvis, you know, some of the past presidents, some of the big-time sports celebrities, when we get there, they're going to be no different than we are. They may think they're right here right now, but God says the meekest will inherit the earth, not the people that are up here. Amen? So why don't we, as I've said before, work on that right now while we're here? Why don't we be the one that doesn't show favoritism, doesn't judge a person by what they look like. Because God knows the heart. Maybe we need to spend a little bit more time investing in knowing a person, knowing their story, and knowing their heart. That's the only way you can disciple to other people. Romans 12, 16 says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Amen. Treat everybody equal. You know, forever that I've been coming over here, the people in the church have treated me very, very well. Their hearts are all in the right place. They, you know, the church has turned around, it's started to grow, and they give some of that credit to me. You know, God used me in a way that that would work. But they also try to let me have my own parking place. Put me ahead of other people sometimes when things are going on. And I appreciate that because their heart is right. They want to put somebody before themselves, but I'm not the one. I don't want to be treated that way. And I'm going to tell you all that right now. I don't want to be treated that way. I put my pants on the same way the rest of you do, and I'm no different than you are. And if I appear that way, you're the one to come and say, hey, you're wrong. You're being favored, showing favorites. It's not going to happen because that's one thing I can't stand because I've been treated that way myself. Favoritism doesn't work. So I appreciate the hearts of everybody, but once again, treat me just like everybody else. You know, some people call me and they say, hey, Brother Reggie, and I appreciate that because I'm their brother. But some people call me Reggie and people get upset with them. Don't get upset with them because I'm Reggie. I'm Brother Reggie, I'm Reggie, I'm Pastor Reggie, I'm whatever you want to call me. And I've been called some things that probably I didn't want to be called, but that's me. Probably created that myself. Be who you are. Love everybody. Give everybody the benefit of the doubt. You know, if you have someone you can't really agree with, you don't have to spend a lot of time with them. But you treat them with respect. You get more back when you do it that way. What did they say? It's better to give than to receive. 
Put everybody before you. The Bible's real clear. Everyone else comes first. It's not about me. I hope you all get that example and you work with that. I watched a video this week of an interesting deal. There were some guys that were, they were doing this experiment. And they were going around to different places doing experiments on people and people's personalities. So they went into this really rich town, the area of town that you know, it's all the elite. It's all the rich people that have lots of money or they drive nice cars, the whole deal. They parked a car right along the side of the curb, rolled down the windows and laid three $20 bills up on the dash, left a couple laying down in the seat. And they were going to see how many people in this area would take that money right there in plain sight. The first guy that came along, you know, he looked like he, he was in upper class. He got out of a real nice car, parked up a few spaces up, walked down the street, saw that money, reached in there and grabbed it and started to walk away. Well, the producer went and run him down. He said, hold on, hold on. He said, you just took our money out of that car. He said, did you need that for something? He just looked at him and threw the money at him. He figured out he was filming this, so he threw the money at him and he ran away. The next guy that came by had on a three-piece nice suit and tie, really looked sharp. You know, they put the money back. He saw it, and he takes the money, reaches in the car and takes all the money and starts walking away with it. So they run him down and start questioning him. And he said his excuse is, well, I was going to try to find whose it was. <laughs> we know whose it was. He went in that car. So he kind of had egg on his face, and he gave the money back to him. The very next guy was a big guy. He's kind of burly, not dressed very nice at all. He had a vest on with a bunch of patches all over it. Long beard. He looked pretty rough. And he walked by and saw that money, and he starts reaching in there, taking it off the dash, leans over in the seat, and then starts to walk away. The producer runs him down. He tells him, hey, you just took our money. He said, can you tell me why you need that money? He goes, I didn't take your money. He said, y'all can't leave money laying on the dash like that or in the seat. Somebody's going to take it. He said, I put it all in the glove box for you. He was a veteran. And the producer was a veteran. And, you know, we asked him, he said, hey, are you homeless? He goes, yeah. He goes, I can't get any support. I can't get any help. But I'm doing the best I can. He had an opportunity to walk away with $100, and he put it in the glove box. He did the right thing. How do we judge people? This producer not only helped him out with several hundred dollars, gave him a place to stay, went and helped him find a job, the whole shooting match. That's sometimes how it works. Someone like that makes you very proud, but it will also humble you, make you eat crow because you don't look at a person that way See, there's some good people in this world and there's some people with some real messed up ideas this week's election meant a lot to many of us the Christian vote showed up in 81% this year whether your candidate won or lost the ones that your candidate won, you're all excited and you're all happy. If your candidate lost, you're not so happy. One thing I ask you to remember, God wants us all to be equal. But he also asks us to remember that he's the one that makes the decision, not us. He's the one on the throne and he's the one that's going to lead us where we need to go. I do believe as Christians, if we cry out when we're in bondage, just like his people, he will answer our prayers. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you once again, and we're just so thankful. Father, we're thankful for the music that opens our hearts. Father, we thank you for our special music. And Father, today, Father, we ask that you just be with us in, a, in the upcoming days as we go grow closer to the holidays, that we begin to focus on the needs of others, not on our own needs. Let us not make it about us. Let's make it about everybody else. Father God, if we find ourselves from time to time putting ourselves above somebody, Father, I pray that you would just touch our heart and remind us that your word is that we are all equal. Father, I pray that you continue to show favor and blessings on your church house right here. Father, I pray for each individual. I would pray for protection around each one as they travel. 
Father, I pray for the holidays coming up, that each one of them will find that peace in their house. And Father, I pray for our newly elected president and the Congress and the Senate. We pray, Father God, that they would be about you, that they would put you first in every action, everything that they do, and move themselves over. That they would, Father God, look at the normal person, the middle class person. Father, the person that is walking with God and all the ones that stepped up, Father God, because of you. I pray, Father God, that we continue to be about you, that you lead, guide, and direct us in the way we should go. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.